Hello everyone and welcome. Today we'll be talking about mobile ad revenue and monetization. More specifically, we will discuss where is mobile ad revenue and monetization going into 2022 and then what happened in 2021. And we will specifically address the impact of IDFA deprecation as well. But we've been here before. And in fact, this same group talked about this issue back in January. And so we are back now with this update. And on with us today, first, Josh Chanley, CEO of Wild Card Games, a rapidly growing mobile game studio building classic card games. Second, Sophia, Sophia Gilia Zova. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Sophia. Really Head well of ad. Okay, thank you. Head of ad monetization at Social Point, the mobile games division of Take Two. And finally, Offer Yehudai, president of Fiber, and Fiber builds monetization platforms for mobile publisher. And I basically take that to mean that they're, you're, they're operating an ad mediation and bidding platform. All right. Well, guys, I thought we could start by talking about CPMs. Now, there was a lot of predictions in terms of where CPMs would, would head kind of going into IDFA deprecation ahead of that. And there was a view that CPMs would drop a lot. And so in terms of what you guys have actually seen in practice, can we talk about some of the predictions versus reality? And then also in terms of like, you know, kind of counterbalancing the CPM loss versus ad revenue, what are you guys seeing? And maybe we can start with you, Josh. Yeah. Um... I think talking with Sophia, I think we're on the same page here, and it so boring. Um, we, I think it was a very kind of spicy, scary uh, discussion topic uh, earlier this year. Um, I was seeing uh, Deconstructor of Fun Old Dev Memo talking about strong possibilities of a 50% decrease in CPMs. Um, and, you know, overall, like very extreme impact for ad monetized games. Um, what we saw was in CPMs uh, between now and before IDFA, IDFA apocalypse, we were calling it at the time, uh, we've seen uh, CPMs go up. Oh. Uh, um, okay. Very slightly, uh, like 0 to 5% on iOS and um, a little bit more than that on Android. Um, but we, we operate a primarily a casual portfolio. Um, so that's a little bit different. Um, overall, at ArpDAO, we saw as flat on iOS and noticeably more positive uh, on Android. Oh, so overall, um, we've been able to grow our business substantially right. um, in this period. And, and Josh, do you, do you have any thoughts in terms of why that happened? I think certainly on the Android side, there was a little bit of a rush over to Android, you know, with with IDFA. But uh, but even seeing that on the iOS side, any any theories? Any speculation? Yeah, I mean, it's very, very difficult to, to really guess. Mm -hmm. um, I am, I'm actually really curious to hear Offer and Sophia's feedback there. Okay. I think it's a mix of the, a couple of things. Um, on the, the UA side, kind of deviating away from Edmond for a second, um, we didn't have a problem where we were rebuilding from scratch. Uh, on the majority of iOS campaigns, we started with something well balanced where any well run uh, UA organization kind of knows where their next dollar is going to go and where their next dollar pulled will come from. So just because overall measurement became at the, the, the app level almost mm -hmm. in the short term, or at least the app geo level, um, we still kind of knew it was balanced uh, and it was difficult to maintain grow, to grow fast because it's very hard to measure, but um, there, at least for most advertisers, there wasn't a, a strong reason to make massive pullbacks. Um, and uh, then additionally, um, in the short term, fingerprinting was very helpful. Um, that is definitely <laughs> yeah, that uh, help. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so I, I think we have the explanation, if, if I'm being yeah, well, honest. <laughs> I mean, fingerprint, well, it, it, not necessarily. Okay. Um, Really interesting uh, things about fingerprinting um, is it, it's fading. Okay. Um, so we're able to compare um, fingerprinted app installs to mediation to media sources. Okay. Come and compare those directly to the attribution from SK Ad Network. So in theory, if fingerprinting was perfect, 
if we had 100 installs to media source A okay. with fingerprinting, we would have 100 coming back from SK Ad Network. So yeah. we can actually compare in real time how um, efficacious or how effective um, fingerprinting is. Okay. Um, in June, what we saw was that for every essentially 100 installs that we got via SK Ad Network, yeah. about 90% were caught with fingerprinting and then 10% the MMPs gave up and just said, organic, we don't know. Um, now, um, in September, um, fingerprinting is only catching about two thirds of installs. Hmm. So about a third are coming back as organic. Okay. And that seems to be pretty par for the course. I've heard other numbers, but nothing's hugely uh, different from that point. Um, okay. So what you would expect to see if fingerprinting was entirely um, causing this is the CPMs would fade in line with fingerprinting fading. And right. we haven't seen that, which okay. is, is really, really bullish for um, the ad ecosystem um, over the next 12 months as it probably fades to 50%-ish, who knows? But um, that would be my expectation. Uh, offer, any thoughts? Well, so it's 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 really really interesting and and we talk about numbers and Josh you gave your, your experiences is, is is very accurate you know but we we can slice it into a couple of verticals first when we talk about CPM drop we have to differentiate different game genres because we know not all games behave the same and also different ad units so like for, I can tell you for instance on average on iOS we notice like between twelve to 18% drop on, on CPMs on a certain amount of time. But this is for all ad units aggregated. If you look at banners versus interstitials and rewarded video, they all behave differently. Mm. And that's interesting because the buyers behind each unit differ, right? Some performance marketers will, will heavily invest in rewarded video and you may see more, more Omni and brands are buying typical display banners. And those, and those audiences, those, those cohorts, will react differently to the lack of IDFA. So for, I can share, for instance, again, to, to, to my very positive surprise, that CPMs on rewarded video uh, weren't affected. Some actually went up, like you said, Josh, because for most performance marketers, they already use a, either contextual targeting or different signals. Maybe they use fingerprinting to your point. I really don't know, but we didn't see that effect on rewarded video. I can tell you that some uh, brand buyers, typically the ones who use cookie matching and like uh, deeper tracking for users, they have a harder time buying a banner advertising, right? right. And, and we've seen the shift to Android. By the way, we did see how for the first time ever in a given month, there are more days where Android revenue are higher than iOS, which typically wasn't the, wasn't the case. It wasn't the case before, right? right? So. We have to break those numbers apart. Also, if you remember last time, uh, while I was still at Fiber, Joe, since then we got acquired by Digital Turbine, but uh, uh, we talked about the opt-in rate, right? And we sat here and trying to guess how many people actually opt-in, and remember there were so many, so many guesses. I think it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore, right? Because the numbers are so low, so if it's like 15 or 22, like, who cares? I mean, we are getting, we, we got uh, used really, really fast to just work without IDs and with different, you know, legit alternatives. And, and that's that's a big kudos to us as an industry that we managed to go through this uh, apocalypse and, and, and at least for now, survive. Right, Sophia? You, you guys are doing great. I, I was kind of laughing listening about the opt-in rates. As you guys remember, there was like a massive amount of articles talking yep. about how to optimize your ATT pop-up, what to do with it, test different colors, test different buttons, different shape of the buttons. And now we're there and there was like a lot of hype about it. And now we're here and we agree with you, Offer and Josh, uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> of course, we see like if we see different audience, we see their reaction to ATT, it kind of stayed the same. Maximum, how you can actually, you know, in increase the opt-in rate, it's not going to be massive. It could be a uh, 5% or maybe seven, but eventually we do not see really a, a big change that can, that this, this uh, improvement can cause. So 
we've tested this out, we've rolled it this out, we've seen certain results, and we kind of kept it in the games with some ideas to maybe test it later when we have more time. But as you know, in our industry, especially with all the recent events, we have, we never have time. Um, in regards but to Sophia, the, could, sorry, yeah. sorry, but could could we unpack that a little bit in terms of why do, do lower opt-in rates not matter? Like I've heard of some techniques, for example, taking the opt-in traffic and just projecting that onto a cohort. Is is it because of techniques that people are using, or why does the opt-in rate not matter? Uh, it does matter in general okay. if you have an opt-in rate difference between thirty percent. If you have one game that has fifty-five percent opt-in rate versus twenty percent or seventeen percent opt-in rate, clearly they would be a certain difference, but that difference would only cover Facebook buying a little bit more on that app versus Facebook not buying anything on the app, and okay. that's more or less it. And of course, it, then then when we talk about the genres, you have to see how much your game is dependent on Facebook on both sides, right, on UA and also on the monetization. If it depends a lot, your opt-in rates will matter for you. Uh, if, if you don't, then they won't, right? So. It's, it's what Offer also mentioned. It's really, really dependent on the genre and dependent on the on your mix, on your stack, on your ad networks that you're working with. Um, so ECP and WISE, we've seen very different results. We okay. did not see a crazy hyped drop that we all were scared of. Right. Um, but we've seen light declines on iOS in certain games and uh, stability on the other games and when okay. we talk about Ardao, it actually has been quite positive for us in general while i would say ios Ardao has been like a little bit stagnating in some of the games and android was in the explosive growth it's looking like what we discussed okay but so for you sophia you are seeing slight declines in in uh in cpms but and may maybe the difference being that the portfolio of the you know social point games is a little bit more mid-core or hardcore versus Josh's portfolio, which is a little more casual. Is that w how you would attribute that? Yes, that's correct, Joe. I think that okay. we've currently we've also started working with an absolutely incredible team at Dots this year. Mm -hmm. And in two Dots, it's adding up on our genre and our expertise to see on how everything behaves. And, and it's actually really, really great to see such a big differences. And as you know, we also have uh, a word game studio where we can see uh, also certain trends which not necessarily align with our mid-core portfolio. Okay. So we have and, it all, legit. Got it. And, sorry, and Offer, you mentioned that part of the reason why things may not be so bad is contextual advertising. And I, actually, I think you raised this during our initial call that, that you know, contextual would potentially be a mitigation. But could you explain for the audience that doesn't understand how contextual advertising works, could, could you explain what, what that is? Yeah, sure. I mean, eventually, marketers and, and are looking for signals that will tell them, oh, is this an impression I want to buy and how much should I pay for it, right? And ideally, we'll have all the data available, uh, but of course, we, we want to live in a world where we respect user privacy. So by going contextual, we are using signals that are on the device that are not identifying the user, but they are giving the marketer enough information to say, should I bid? and what is a good range uh, for, for that bid. So for instance, what is the historical average a click-through rate on a specific placement? Will tell us, I mean, should we, should we go hard on this if we're looking for a performance or if it's more about brand awareness, I am less sensitive to, to click-through rate, for instance. Um, a, a cohorts of, uh, of impressions that they already serve the specific A domain. Okay, so if I know this audience already saw a lot of ads that are match three, do I want to sell them yet another match three type of, uh, of ad? So those are examples of contextual signals that are relate more to the content and less to the user. And, the, and they are stored on the device. And this way there is also less concern around, around data leaks. And the more we are getting better and better as an industry, and this is by the way not, not a proprietary or, or like a secret solution for one company of the other, the more we as an industry are moving from a user level or, or people-based targeting to contextual, everything looks better. So I think we started as an industry, we haven't finished yet. And it, even, even Facebook Audience Network, I believe I read some publications are now moving to contextual targeting and will start bidding more on non-IDFA traffic. I think it's good for all of us. Got it. 
And then in our first discussion, we did have uh, you know, a bit of discussion around pro programmatic um, advertising. And since that last discussion to now, what's, what's kind of changed, if anything at all? And Josh, are you still seeing these crazy CPM hotspots based upon the use of programmatic or what, what's going on there? Oh, definitely. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, just to be totally transparent, I mean, with uh, Fiber's platform, we've still seen really strong performance looking at those hotspots. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing CPMs be profitable to target at you know over three hundred dollars at times in the U.S. Wow. Um, so that that is definitely still there, which is a really really interesting change. I'd say it maybe has declined somewhat, um, but not by. Uh, any, any massive um, amount, and the 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 delta in our waterfall between uh, lap traffic and non-lap traffic does seem to, on the whole, be declining as ad networks make that transition to more contextual targeting. Um, they were already, relatively speaking, more contextual, a lot more contextual than Facebook and Google, uh, and almost infinitely more. But there's still uh, there's a lot more gains to be made there, I think, and I think we're seeing that as the 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 lat and non lat CPMs slowly start to converge together. Okay, and uh, offer, would you agree with that, or is are there any other updates you can uh, offer us operating such a platform? In general, I try to always agree with Josh. <laughs> uh, I will add that we, you know. We still see some publishers closer to, to, to Sophia's like mid-core and like uh, in a purchase heavy publishers are still maintaining lat and non-lat waterfall. Josh, I'm not sure about you guys if you still mm -hmm. do it or not. Uh, and I think it's still a good tip for a publisher if you don't do it, you, you may consider because there are still again pockets of audiences, again, especially if you if if again in, in a purchase and mid-core it maybe make will make a bit more sense. But that's something I will I will recommend publishers to still to still use and try out. Sophia, I think you guys are trying it as well, right? Or using it as well? Well, this is maybe a small surprise coming here is that we've tried it, but we are not really seeing a lot of uplift. But there is a reason for it. Um, our games have in general relatively high number of non-IDFA users, or just IDFA not available, due to also uh, age reasons. So we have an age gate in our games, therefore we've been, let's say, we had a pretty big uh, chunk of traffic uh, without anything. We were ready for what, what's going to happen. Therefore, right now, when we added up a little bit, in our opt-in rates in mid-core games tend to be relatively high, uh, I would say higher than in the industry, we did not find yet value or like big incremental value and in running two uh, separate waterfalls. While ours are already granular enough and uh, let's say optimized enough also in terms of latency. So I think that could be a reason number two, why we're not actually seeing a huge uplift. Regardless of that, I've heard from a lot of publishers, also apart from George and many others, that this is a really good tactic. So I would actually also recommend that. As long as it works for you, it's just great. It's, it's, a, it's a good one to, to try out. Right. And, you know, I think maybe the next question I could ask is really around specific genres. There was a lot of speculation, including for myself, where, you know, there was some thinking around specific genres being more impacted by IDFA than others. I, I think, Offer, you had predicted that the prevailing doom and gloom around hyper-casual was overstated and actually just kind of looking at the data. So I pulled some numbers for a portfolio, like I created a basket of hyper, you know, leading hyper casual companies and kind of looked at the, the data uh, for the past year. And it seems like, you know, certain, certain com publishers were up in terms of revenue and, or, and others were down a little bit. But overall, the revenue seemed flat, downloads seemed down about 15%. So just wanted to like ask you guys in terms of in specific genres in terms of impact by IDFA. And the other theory I had, and maybe you could speak to this, Sophia, would, would, was that the more mid-core or hardcore uh, a game is, it, I mean, maybe this is more of a UA question, but that, that I felt that you know, those kind of games would have a harder time maintaining their ROAS. But I don't know, maybe we could just start there in terms of maybe Sophia, like, any differences you're seeing across different genres 
in particular? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, uh, all the games, we can even make it more simple. Like all the games that okay. been dependent on Facebook <laughs> were suffering. All the games were yeah. not dependent on Facebook and user <laughs> acquisition were kind of fine. And okay. well, I want to give credit to our marketing department as we prepared a lot to this. Like we, we went along with this hype. We were very ready when everything happened. We've uh, decreased our dependency on certain channels as much as we can. And we've also, let's say, pull up some mitigation metrics for it. And that worked out. So we did not encounter a lot of issues, right? But also because we do not really have super hardcore games that need specifically need uh, very niche players and everything. Yeah. I okay. definitely use that little period of time to push admon to all these games because I said, you know, hey, let's diversify. Let's not, uh, you know, put too much on IPs. Like we have a possibility to work with um, lower tenure users and put a little bit more ads in there. And it actually worked out for us. But um, overall, I mean, all is fine. I'm positive. I was positive and I'm still positive. It all worked out. <laughs> At least for us. Offer? I, I want to say something in, in, in a good way. So help okay. me out if I don't phrase it here totally. No, no, seriously, seriously. What, what I like so much about our industry is that we are trained to think about certain things as the only absolute truth. Like, without IDFA, hyper-casual will die. Oh my God. Yeah. We have to optimize ATT pump because the, the opt-in otherwise it will go from 60 to, to 2. Um, there is only one mediation that can work. And, and without Facebook, your waterfall will collapse. We are trying to think this way. Yeah. Last week, we had the, uh, the funniest, craziest, the largest A-B testing ever, when unfortunately, Facebook suffered like nine hours of downtime, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing worked for Facebook, not even the audience network. And we are great partners of Facebook. I like them a lot. But you know, I heard from publishers that you know, during those nine hours, it was okay. <laughs> Meaning, Meaning we, we are trying to think about certain absolute truth and right. then when you put them to a test, you realize, okay, you know, hyper casual did not collapse. Mm -hmm. The opt-in rate is still 12%. We can change the waterfall in the network. We might even make more money. So what I'm trying to tell publishers listening to us, uh, and we're trying to keep it real, don't be afraid to try new stuff and right. test. We have no idea. We, we keep... You know, we keep the, the momentum of what we know from a couple of years ago, but the market is very dynamic. And, and that's what I like about it so much, right? Never a dull moment. Right. And definitely, you know, shout out to you, Offer, for, for being right on your call on hyper casual. <laughs> I was definitely a little bit more pessimistic on hyper casual, but I, I was actually more pessimistic, not also because of IDFA, but I believe that Apple just doesn't like the, those games. So I thought they were going to mm. just like, you know, what, what Apple wants, they usually get. So that, that was the other theory behind that. But, but Josh, users love those, you know, users love, love those games. And eventually, right, that's true. Apple definitely yeah. follow their users' heart in, in, in most cases, right? And users love it. Josh, any, any other thoughts? Or should we move on to the next topic? No, I think uh, Offer and Sophia were uh, really right on there. Okay, and maybe just to close the loop on, on this stuff, in terms of impact of IDFA, have you guys changed any practices at all, or are, are there things that you're doing to mitigate? I, I know, Josh, you had talked before during our first call about ways in which you can optimize, you know, the, the, the way you optimize ads to try and offset potential declines in CPMs, but it doesn't sound like we do have those declines in CPMs, but is there any way in particular that you guys are changing how you operate at all? Uh, on the on our side, the only major difference is that we do uh, operate separate waterfalls for LAT and non-LAT traffic. Right. right. Um, that has been, um, uh, I'd say, incrementally very helpful, um, and that's been that's been quite um, interesting. Um, and the other than having one more thing to manage. The, uh, the only other change is that on our lap waterfalls, we are um, much more active in testing big, meaningful changes. Mm -hmm. um, usually it's um, on IDFA or Google inventory, it's always about incrementally moving the needle. Whereas um, the, the, the lap environment is just really interesting because there's so many quality ad networks out there 
and they're all um, making very meaningful improvements. So just where they are bidding most effectively is, is changing very quickly. Um, so making sure that you have a mediation platform that allows you to A-B test meaningful changes and allows you to be agile, um, it, I would say is a, is a good advantage in this environment right now. Okay. Offer or Sophia, any, any thoughts? Well, what I can add is last time we've discussed, right, like diversifying and diversifying mm -hmm. ad networks plus um, ad formats, and we've followed that route. We've added uh, a couple of, let's say, contextual-based networks. So the networks that know how to do this right, right before um, 14.6, I believe, was released, and actually one of them was Fiber. And it paid off really well because these guys, uh, you know, they straight away they picked up the traffic left from Facebook and they started slowly ramping up. So that that helped a lot. Um, and in terms of diversifying, I mean, we work with a bunch of ad formats and we have put extra development effort in improving um, user interaction with those. And it also paid off a lot, especially in one of our biggest games. So not much of a change more than that. Um, last time we, I think as a group, we, we advise publishers to always keep your SDKs up to date. So it's always yeah. the case. It always really, really helps. Uh, I know it's hard, but you know, for any monetization manager listening, I mean, make sure you guys understand this all uh, SK uh, ad network stuff for 14.5 and 15. I mean, it's a lot. It changes it dynamically, but you know, you should really understand what's happening there. So I would definitely encourage guys and they're amazing a Slack channels and groups and blogs about the data is out there. Don't uh, don't set it aside. A and lastly, you know, we as we move to contextual, I would uh, definitely recommend publishers big enough. And I think uh, with the, with consolidation, it's now happening more and more. Start think about brand advertising, brands and agencies. You know, they are stepping in. I know every year we say that's the year for brands, and it's it never is, and true. But you know. It's getting better and better all the time, and I feel like there is a tipping point that you know, we may have crossed. And with the application of IDFA, all screens are equally dumb, and and you know users are playing games. So and brands understand it. So if you're big enough, if you have IP, if you have compelling games and good cohorts, and you don't engage with some level of brand advertising, I think you should. Got it. Okay, so I thought we could move to a, a controversial topic. <laughs> <laughs> and so that is, uh, and so one of the big questions from our last conversation is a direction in which data transparency is moving. And Josh, you in particular during that previous conversation mentioned, for example, access to data such as how much an ad network is paid to show a specific user and impression. Sophia, you mentioned you weren't able to see bids in programmatic, but in just like this general topic of data transparency, which way has this moved since our last talk? Are we moving more toward, towards increasing data transparency or are we moving away from it or are we kind of at the status quo? What do you guys think? <laughs> uh, I'm curious to hear what Sophia has to say. But I'll, I'll go first just so that someone does. Um, from, from my perspective, um, uh, at least ad revenue and ad monetization transparency has um, improved overall. Okay. Great. Um, uh, Facebook and Google and the larger walled gardens are still trying their best to withhold bid information. Mm -hmm. And the, the rationale for that is that um, if everyone knows what they're bidding for users, then their user becomes their, their data becomes less unique and therefore less valuable in bidding situations. Uh, I think offers probably much more aware of that than I am. Um, I believe the majority of mediation platforms now forward that bid information or extremely close proxies that technically do not defy the Facebook terms and conditions. Um, so our ability to A-B test and optimize is, has definitely improved and it, it's come in handy. Um, we now have the ability to do things like even with the iOS 14.6 um, A-B test different um, interstitial frequencies based on whether a user has or does not have the IDFA available. Um, again, 
because a lot with a lot with display advertising that's not opt-in like reward um, unlike iap where you you leverage your engagement for monetization with interstitials and banners you're often spending retention on monetization and if you know that you're going to be spending it and getting say 25 to 30 percent less back you might want to test showing fewer or you might want to test different strategies and being able to actually measure that out to day 30, 60, 90, 180, and see what those long-term impacts are is incredibly valuable. Uh, there are still um, some issues. For instance, um, I think one thing that's leaving money on the table for everybody is Google's insistence on using no more than three um, line items. Um, I, I see Sophia reacting a little bit there. Uh, uh, it's uh, we have uh, run tests increasing that number um, to identify which three we should be going with, and every time we go from three to five, three to six, three to eight, we see major revenue increases because Google has a lot of inventory to add. But because Google knows that everybody can see what those line items bid at and what they're filling at and who they're filling for, they choose to restrict it to just three. Um, because that enables them to keep their cards close to their vest. Um, I'd contrast that to show the counter hypothesis, a counter um, strategy. Uh, we uh, on iOS interstitial, we're currently running 11 floors with fiber. And that level of transparency is extremely valuable because it allows us to do that CPM hotspotting and find those valuable, those valuable places. Uh, Sophia, what do you think? Well, thanks for, for taking the, the first response, right? I appreciate it, Josh. Um, well, yes, I was smiling about, uh, you know, this uh, gangster technique that you're using with ad -hoc. Like, respect, Josh, really. Uh, definitely encourage all that. But look, I have a very mixed feeling because from one side, yes, we run a test, we have uh, you know, impression level data. Now it be finally becoming a norm in, in the industry. So amazing. Some data is still missing, but you know, we do not expect this to change in the near future. Some data, you know, was still there. So overall, it's fine. But if you think about everything that happens in the industry, where with all the acquisitions, where data is just being sold and bought all the time. That, to me, doesn't look like a healthy trend, and that, to me, looks very worrying. So if we talk about data transparency and, and privacy of the data from that perspective, that's definitely not a good trend, in my opinion. I don't know, for what, you, what do you think? No, I, I agree with both of you again. Um, I think the industry moved forward, and, and I think most decent mediation and, and monetization platform today offer that level of transparency and, and A-B testing, to your point, Josh, in, in a very granular way. It wasn't the case two years ago, so mm -hmm. de definitely great. But uh, Sophia, you also point on, I mean, data has became a, almost like a, like a tool for some, for some uh, players, and, you know, whatever they become... Uh, too big or the, um, the, the type of assets and properties that, you know, they have access to data from, uh, it's definitely an advantage. Again, advantage can be good, uh, it can be also bad if it's against you, so it's also a matter of, uh, of perspective. But I agree data is something that, again, every marketer, every, every publisher should be aware of who has access to their data and, you know, what's their level of comfort that, you know, those, those partners have access to this data. And I would leave it as that because the answer will be different for different partners and different publishers. Right. And Josh, during our last conversation, you had voiced a concern about potentially if you don't get enough data back, you won't be able to effectively run A-B tests. But it sounds like you, you are able to effectively run A-B tests. So just want to confirm that. And the other point you raised from last time was like the... Um, the platform providers themselves having A-B testing capabilities and the potential for them to use that data so that, you know, maybe Offer and Fiber, you know, take that data and create Super Lion Studios or something like that. But I, I don't know if uh, you guys want to comment on, on, on that or what's the current status? Uh, yeah, so we can definitely run A-B tests. Oh. Um, that, that's been... Um, 
frankly, getting better and better, which is a, a huge relief um, because the, the data transparency allows us to be agile in a time where things are changing pretty quickly. So that's, that's hugely appreciated by uh, the developers. Um, yeah, regarding the ownership of data, being able to kind of see things, I think that's one of the key advantages of a mediation platform is you can kind of see what everyone's bidding and see which users everybody thinks is valuable. Um, and I mean, just, just this morning at the time of this podcast taping or video capture, whatever you want to call that, uh, Unity announced formally that they are taking their semi-secret mediation product out into open beta. Mm -hmm. um, so now that means that essentially all the big players, um, except for Facebook, have their, their own mediation platform. Right. That, that should be a strong indicator for how valuable um, the data you get from mediation is. Um, and it should be something you take into consideration when you're, when you're choosing a mediation partner. Okay, um, so maybe just speaking of data, one of the predictions I had from last year was something that I just called data wars of 2021. And basically like this, it, it was just announced that at the App Levin SDK had been rerouting uh, mm -hmm. SK Ad Network postbacks to itself. And so I was hoping you guys could comment on this particular <laughs> news item <laughs> in terms of this behavior. Um, it, maybe you guys could talk about what this actually means. Is it true? Because I, I, I know there's some, some controversy there. Josh, I know you are also kind of like the poster child of AppLovin, so don't feel like <laughs> we, we want to save your status with AppLovin. I, I, I know they're mad at me, but you know they don't need to be mad at you, so, so don't feel like you need to say anything negative about them. But um, maybe Offer and Sophia, could you talk about, you know, what, what does this mean and what, what is the, what's your interpretation of that specific news item? I let Offer go first. <laughs> <laughs> so look, uh, as we record this right now, I, I, don't, I don't know much more than what I read uh, just like you in the news, right? So... It's hard for me to say anything, to add anything smart, but I would, I would say this for, again, for publishers, and it goes back to the previous comment. Guys, you have to understand what's going on with your, with your app and the way you implement stuff and where data goes. Okay, again, and the, I'm not, not saying anything on a plugin right now because I don't know, but in general, mm -hmm. I mean, publishers must be aware, especially with SCAD, when you, when you do have the, as a publisher, you do have control over the endpoints and where data go. And with 14.6, you, 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 you do get the prospect. You can opt in. Make sure you understand what's happening, okay? Uh, I think that's what we should be aware of because data now, as we said, it's important. It's, it's your asset. Before it's anyone else's, it's your asset. And you have to protect and understand what's happening to that data, right? You can't blame anyone else if you don't understand. Of course, we, we believe that, you know, everyone are doing things in the right way and maybe, I know, Maybe people make mistakes from time to time, but as publishers, please please understand, it's also your responsibility. Sophia, what what is your view as like you know like like a mid core publisher that you know also has a lot of data? After, after such a politically correct response, I just don't know what's wrong here. But um, yeah, well, as Oprah said, the news broke just now. I'll just put it that way, I just didn't have enough time to uh, think about it. All right, now, uh, well, I can just, you know, second to offer saying, yes, you have to understand data and you have to also be aware of how this data can be used by certain players, right? Yeah. These type of news and, you know, there were other ad networks that have been, you know, kind of meddling with SDKs and everything, like we were placing software development kits in our applications so maybe it could be a good exercise to even ask your tech team to look into it and to, to help you understand what type of data and what type of data it can collect. And you can actually predict what type of, how, how this data can, let's say, be useful to somebody except your own company, right? And maybe based on that, make a choice of, of your partnerships. But that's, I guess, everything I can tell. 
So I'm going to interpret that as watch out for the app loving. But Josh, <laughs> as the poster child of app loving, do you want to say a few words in their defense? Just because we, we, we want to be balanced here. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> Well, I definitely don't want to be app loving stool pigeon here, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that before I kind of dive into it, uh, I think one of the things that Offer said resonates with me really, really strongly. Mm -hmm. um, it's the large players, one of their best tools is to make things um, very convoluted and confusing and interwound and complicated. Um, and that allows them to gain a greater competitive advantage. Um, and it's very important to understand where your data is going and what it's being used for. Um, I remember, I still, think this is, I still think this is true, but one of App Annie's um, products is it lets you, it basically it would compete with the app stores for data visualization and it let you pipe in all of your ad network data, all of your iTunes data, all of your Google Play data, and it would visualize your downloads for you and your IAP revenue really, really nicely, all for free. The free data viz tool. Why was that? Because they were using it to sell it on for their algorithms. Um, so it's important to understand, and, and it's not to say that App Annie is a bad company, that's a totally fair exchange, they create value. Um, but it's important to understand where your data is going. Um, so unfortunately, I did actually have some time last night to investigate this app loving issue. So I guess I'm gonna kind of uh, jump in. Um, I, I can confirm that they actually, they did do the thing. Okay. Um, uh, however, what they did is, very clear, un or, sorry, very unclear, um, at least in public right now. Um, and it's kind of due to two reasons. Um, first of all, there's only been one article that I know of published. Uh, the article that was published actually had a lot of misinformation in it and things that are factually not true about how SK Ad Network works. Okay. Um, and, um, uh, additionally, um, it, it, it kind of feels in the article like AppLovin is being confused, uh, accused of doing it in secret rather than aggressively publishing it and documenting it and telling um, developers that they're doing this um, to help and that it was known beforehand that it was going to happen. Um, so I. I guess the re the reason that I, I I kind of called I suppose the apple oven stool pigeon a lot or the apple oven <laughs> um, shill is, is because I try to take a more balanced approach, um, but I know there's a lot of uh, yeah. negative towards I mean, apple because they're a strong right. computer. So I mean I think that it's important that we get to the truth. Like if mm -hmm. what apple oven has done is mischaracterized, then I I, I think you know, I mean. Even though App Lovin doesn't like me too much, I would hate for them to I'm be mischaracterized. <laughs> I'd hate for them to be mischaracterized for doing something that that wasn't the intention. So if that's the case, right. then you know I, I think the truth should should come out. Yeah, and, and I could be wrong. But I could. I mean, my my understanding of what happens, and this could be wrong. This is still emerging. But as, additionally, these tools these are for iOS 15. These tools have been out for like a couple of weeks. So everyone's updating and changing rapidly. And frankly, no one's engineering team has months of experience dealing with these new um, APIs. Or if they did, I'm really impressed. Um, um, but essentially, on iOS 14.5, um, with SK Ad Network, Apple started to send back uh, postbacks to the ad networks. And that was how SK Ad Network worked. Um, problem, um, that means two things. One, you can have bad actors, aka fraud, um, and they can start to claim things. And there's no independent way to prove them right or wrong because now the MMP can't play that role as effectively. And second, 
um, companies with vast data lakes like Facebook can simply refuse to pass them on. And a big objective of SK Ad Network was to damage Facebook, in my opinion. Um, so that wasn't going to stand. So on iOS 15, which is just now rolling out, in fact, I don't know, Sophia, about your games, but we're only just now preparing our iOS 15 um, build because it's there's so much stuff in SK Ad Network and it's so confusing. And there's so much new technology that has to be built that it's very challenging. Um, so on iOS 15, what Apple did was they, in addition to um, sending SK Ad Network postbacks to the ad networks, they allowed um, app developers to specify an endpoint to send those postbacks to for the developer as well, so we can compare. So if network XYZ claims 50 installs and they actually had five, we can now prevent the fraud. Additionally, um, if Facebook refuses to give us postbacks, we have no idea what, what's happening. We now have our own source, so they can't prevent us from doing that. Um, and that, that, it's really valuable data. No one really knows how valuable yet because we've had it for like two weeks, um, but it's definitely going to be valuable. Um, so what the article is claiming is that for some reason, Apple, and, oh, and so the endpoint for the developers is specified in the plist. It's very basic. And um, so what the, the develop the article is stating is that the Apple 11 overrode this functionality to remove from the plist the endpoints defined by um, the developer, and they put in their own endpoint that forwarded to App 11. Yeah. Um, so um, it was, from my perspective, it was a little. Um, it had definitely had a, a, an angle which was anti App 11, which is fine. Um, but the article made um, some claims about App 11. Essentially, this was tantamount to stealing the data. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, they, they were claiming that App 11 isn't going to get this data. And by stealing it, they're going to get this data. But um, App 11 was already getting SK Ad Network postbacks directly from Apple. Got it. So that doesn't quite make as much sense. Um, however, they do get something new. Um, and what that is, is the attribution data for the other ad networks, which similar to App Annie, that example, where they're being really helpful and they're providing tools for you if you give them all your data. App 11 was trying to get more data, it appears to be. I haven't confirmed that with them, but it's definitely they are able to get net more data. Um, so we're developers harms? Well, it kind of the question is then what is the feature that they were advertising so heavily? And the feature was simple. So the way S, uh, SK Ad Network works in iOS 15, you sent this endpoint. That's super cool. What do you have to do with it? Well, actually now developers have to do things like ingest that data. They have to forward it to their MMP for that anti-fraud. They have to actually play point guard and distribute all this data. So now, rather than an iOS update for a new uh, platform being, you know, make sure your, your shit doesn't crash, make sure there's no weird problems. Now it's, oh, and you have to build massive backend, well, not massive, you have to build backend infrastructure to make your stuff still work properly, the advantage. And the product that App11 was trying to offer, which is very, which is, I guess, kind of sneaky, is essentially that service where it ingests it all for you, displays it for you, and acts as that forwarding service to your MMP and to whatever you want to do. So App 11 never stole the data. They built a feature that um, did work for you so that they would build it once instead of the ever, like the 10,000, 100,000 app developers all building it themselves. Um, and their value add from it for themselves is that they would be able to actually see all the attributions coming from Iron Force, Unity, Google, and Facebook. So from that perspective, what they did um, wasn't that bad. The problem that was fundamentally, in my opinion, way too aggressive is the discussion is, it's not, is Apple 11 stealing data? 
It's should this product have been opt-in versus opt-out? Right. And that's um, where the wrongdoing was. But it, it's kind of a boring thing to do versus the idea that Apple Evans is a super evil megacorp that's stealing all your data. <laughs> uh, so it, yeah. I'm not necessarily saying that Apple Evans is good or bad, uh, big or small or whatever. I'm. It, it appears to be that the facts are that they were too aggressive market trying to push this new feature. Um, and that's a much more, if I am correct, and as my, this happened, this was announced last night, yeah. but for my investigations, that appears to be the case. Um, I could look really, really dumb when we publish this, if more information comes out. Um, that that's, seems to be um, at least what is happening. <clears throat> Even in the article, there's no alleging that Apple 11 refused to share the data. It was just part of this new feature. Um, offer, Sophia, do you have any uh, information to, to add here? Because I, I, I'm totally open to being completely wrong. Um, right. Or maybe offer, Sophia, if you could speak to whether it's this issue or the, the higher level general issue of mm -hmm. whether it's you know ad networks or platforms doing things to gain a competitive edge in some way. What should people be watching out for? if anything specific? Well, I think Josh provided an interesting point of view. You went like kind of hot and cold here and there. Good, bad. <laughs> um, I like it. I think it's actually a really good point that we, may, we maybe did not consider. It is normal to rush to conclusions when we, especially when we see such, such articles. And I think it's, it's important to like what Josh did to dive in, to try to understand what was the initial initial objective for the company. Um, the question is if that objective is the only one or there were a few, right? And potentially aggressive push on the market, which was kind of a, a little issue that, that the company experienced could be something intentional, right? And that's that's what we maybe we will know in the, in the next few days or maybe we won't. But just like with, I think, sort of certain PR scandal with, I believe, Mintegral, where we had, you know, they've been also, they discovered something in the SDK and such. You know that there was a lot of uh, confusing information coming out later after. So I'm just hoping that in this case, we will know for sure if this was the case or not. That's more from my kind of blurred point of view on this. Guys, by, by the time we publish this, I guess we'll have more information. So I actually have a, qu I have a question for you, Josh and Sophia. Um, all those changes, and again, let's put up Lavin aside for a second, but all those changes, how do you look at the description of an admon in your company? Are, are, are admons becoming more product managers, more analysts, more, more tech savvy? Like, it's no longer pushing those, uh, just the floors, right, Josh? I mean, we need to get scared and, and get technical and doesn't that's decay. And I mean, you, Josh, you know your business very, very well, but... I'm safe to assume not everyone are in are in, as you like in the weeds. So, what are we expecting from the monetization teams? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I get extremely pissed when people tell come to me and and uh, you know when they don't know what my team is doing and they come to me and say, uh, "You just guys optimize waterfalls, right? Like, can you just go optimize and get us like really high CPMs?" That is like a trigger, right? Like, I hate to hear that. So for me, it's been already uh, key to make sure that my team and me, myself, we know product, of course, not at the level of product managers, but close to it, right? That, that's our job. We have to participate in, in all key decisions just because we help to monetize. And while there is a, in a purchase of uh, monetization, there is ad monetization and they can be combined in an amazing way. So to your question offer, uh, product is key for, for all ad, ad revenue related uh, activities. I believe such a shift started, uh, well, when Apple made an announcement, I think this actually fostered the shift because, you know, everybody wanted to participate, understand better how with a product they can kind of mitigate the impact of IDFA zero and such and such. And I say it very positively. I think that this is the way and, and overall, the teams, that, the ad revenue related teams, they're extremely transversal teams that should work together with product and also with UA. Because in a lot of games, 
you can you can see a direct impact of LTV. You can try different segmentation tactics uh, based on what campaign you're acquiring users from, and such and such. So both of these has to be uh, super important for their revenue teams, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, I'd say for small studios, at least, um, everyone is becoming uh, kind of closer together. Um, and that transcends just admin teams, like UA teams are becoming much more integrated into development teams. Um, even, even BI teams are becoming much more part of the development team. Um, However, uh, Sophie is also right in that as you scale, ad monetization is still a, a really complex and challenging thing that deserves specialization because it's um, it, it's just such a challenging thing to do. Um, however, uh, I think that some of the positive changes of ad monetization being, I think more integrated is the politically correct way of saying perhaps more listened to um, Sophia, maybe you agree with that, but as we get into things like, okay, if we do deep A-B tests to optimize interstitial frequency, if we figure out how many networks in our stack is optimal, if we A-B test different mediation platforms, if we do all these really cool things, we can generate large LTV impact for our game. Um, those, those things are real. And they're perhaps ignored before because product teams um, and decision makers weren't as um, educated or as up to speed and not listening to the ad monetization teams. But as uh, competitors are making these massive gains, um, that it's becoming proven out that they need um, a larger and larger seat at the table. Yeah, and offer. I think that this point that you're raising is actually a very important point because it does speak to potentially a structural transition that might need to occur because admon teams are going to become the face, the interface of internal data to an external provider of some kind, right? And so should the data police be sitting in admon? Should there be a separate function? Because what you, what, you know, Sophia and Josh are going to have to do is they're going to have to evaluate the partners that they're working with. And if they're not careful, data could leak and all of a sudden, you know, Tiger Studios launches four dots, you know what I'm saying? Like, and so I, I do think this is definitely a challenging issue. And I don't think that a lot of management and executive level folks understand that a lot of strategic function is now increasingly becoming prevalent in these you know, the, the, the kind of data oriented or data facing um, functions like admon. So yeah, definitely a, a uh, maybe a, a hot topic we can address at another time, but, but certainly something that we, people need to watch out for. Yeah, I love this yeah, point. I mean, I, Joe. Go ahead. I love this point, Joe. I think this is, uh, this is a very, very, very relevant uh, thing to say, especially now. And mm -hmm. uh, I think Ofer already mentioned, right? Like, First, first, the developers have to understand what type of data they own and how this data can be useful to somebody except for the company. Uh, yeah. And then the second step is indeed to be making decisions that I know there is always, especially for smaller studios, revenues are extremely important how for big ones too, right? But in this in this specific era of you know consolidation of of, of data of privacy of this data wars, like what you said, Joe, I think this is just becoming key to, um, to understand if you start working with certain partner, if you go ahead and what will happen, even though the revenue numbers can seem amazing or the promises can be amazing, I think it's important just to have this, uh, this point in mind, what you said, like it's a data police, but <laughs> if you can implement a department like that, that would be just great, but maybe we'll, we'll consider that. Go ahead. Yeah, Joe. I mean, the, da the data wars are real, right? Right. Uh, that was a great call out um, that you made a long time ago before I was really thinking about it, to be honest. Um, but it's very obvious that big companies are competing for your engagement data. Big companies are competing for your ad revenue and other ad networks bidding data. And um, 
you know, with this app love and news, it's also clear that companies are already starting to compete for your SK ad network data, whether that's trying to provide services to grab it or like Facebook trying to keep it off of themselves. Um, so understanding the complicated value of what you have and how information flows through kind of the cloud um, to create value for your organization is, is important. And I know we're running a little bit long here, but maybe we could talk about kind of the ecosystem before kind of rolling into final thoughts. Hopefully you guys are okay for time. But wondering if we could now talk about the, the, the general kind of ad ecosystem. And in terms of if you, if you were to think about winners and losers, if you have any comments as, as far as who you thought based upon what kind of transpired from our last call to today, who are some of the winners and losers? And obviously, I, I think one of those winners has got to be Unity, but I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Uh, and, and also in terms of Unity and sort of their performance in terms of ads, I would really be interested in hearing your thoughts in terms of you know, some of the thoughts around how they're able to get that additional performance, probably through fingerprinting. I, I don't know if that's you know public or not, but that, that's sort of the word on the street. But um, what, what are your thoughts in terms of winners and losers? And maybe, I, I don't know, we could start with you, Josh. I don't know. I've gone first a lot. Sophia? Okay. Sophia. All right. I'll take this one. This one. That's, that's completely safe topic, right? So, um, <laughs> so, right. Unity. You said unity. Uh, I think what, we've saw, what we saw in terms of winners and losers, I mean, I, I guess we already discussed losers or loser, let's say. Uh, so if you look into winners, if you look at um, these amazing graphs, sometimes I'm doing for like a share of voice of each ad network, and I, I prefer to do this uh, per platform, just to see the evolution of it starting, let's say from January of 2021 until now. Um, I have to say iOS like makes me happy because it's just one of the most uh, equally balanced amazingly distributed uh, pictures I, I have. Uh, every single share of voice uh, is just very, very, very small, not small, but like normal. It makes me sleep well at night because I am not worried about, oh, what if tomorrow uh, one of these guys, I don't know, deactivate our app or do something else. And it just makes me think on how big of a shift of the industry just that Apple created that was the only way to make this happen, if you think about it, to make this beautifully equal share of voice, a very balanced picture we're seeing on our apps. Um, so contextually, contextual, contextual ad networks who knew how to do it, to me, they're winners, uh, maybe because of what you said, and I said, yes, Joe, like that, uh, fingerprinting or how many names it has right now. Uh, mm -hmm. All of it helped, helped a lot. Um, some other networks, especially Facebook, uh, didn't manage to do anything yet. We're expecting it a lot. We, we like what Offer said. We, we expect a lot uh, contextual ads from it. Um, so, but overall, for us, we sh we see it positively. We balance out our share of voice on iOS, and we feel safer, and we feel like we can actually improve uh, competition. And the competition is currently extremely healthy. So that's our takeaway. Okay. And, yeah. Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was going to say, to, <laughs> please, Joe. <laughs> uh, well, I, yeah, I was just going to ask you, Offer, what your thoughts were, and also with respect to maybe some other players, like, well, um, may, maybe you could also speak to kind of like the news about Unity's ad mediation product, as well as, you know, any, any thoughts on, on Facebook as well? I will, but just do you want to comment to what something Sophia just said? Uh, so I won't break the momentum. Yeah, I was I was just gonna put numbers to it. Okay. Um, the catastrophic loser on iOS has obviously been Facebook, and to a lesser degree Google. Um, I think it's fair to say that most publishers were having at least twenty five to thirty percent of revenue uh, on iOS coming from Fan um, before IDFA, and now that's three to five percent. Wow. Um, so that's, if anyone was unsure who Apple was targeting, if it was user <laughs> privacy or Facebook, uh, yeah. there you go. Uh, sorry, offer. Go ahead. No, no, it's great. Look, <clears throat> guys, winners or losers. Uh, first, I want to say really personally, 
about, about Mopab. You know, Mopab, I want to give them the highest respect. We started Interactive in 2007, you know, it's like the beginning of, of mobile advertising. It was AdMob, Millennial Media, I mean, Mopab, it, it's, it's, it's an era. And I want to give a lot of uh, credit and respect to Mopab, honestly, for pushing for transparency right in the early days, open source their SDK, managed to attract an amazing uh, talented people throughout the years, before Twitter acquired them, after Twitter acquired them, now with Apple, I mean, they've done a lot to the industry and we as, as, as a team, all of us here, I think we own Mopab a lot. Uh, now put aside what will happen with the acquisition of Applavin, will they shut it? No, no, it doesn't matter. It's not a win or a lose for me. I do think we own them a lot, uh, marketers, publishers, platforms, all of us. So that's again, Mopab, it's, it's really a, an end of an era, the way I look at it. And I know many people who work there, still work there. I mean, it's amazing. And for all the Mopab uh, mafia, wherever you guys are, I mean, big kudos for you. It's, uh, I don't take it for granted. Right. Uh, Offer, what do you think are the implications of the acquisition of Mopa by Apple? And what, is, what impact does that have to the ecosystem or to, to, the, to the market? So, you know, right now what we hear from, from the market is that publishers have to make a choice. It's like a trigger event for publishers to make a decision if they are basically, because you can stay on the, on the Mopa platform, it's going to be deprecated, right? So in a matter of uh, three, six months, depending on, you know, different uh, options, but it's a trigger point now in Q4 uh, for publishers to decide, are we moving to, to, to Max? Are we, are we choosing someone else? And it's a decision not all publishers wanted to take specifically, but now they have to take the decision. Um, another implication is on the, on the demand side. Mopub, again, to their credit, uh, operated a, a, a very liquid programmatic marketplace, which is now, to my understanding, is going away. Uh, there are definitely alternatives in the market, but for, for marketers and DSPs who used to, uh, you know, be plugged into the mobile marketplace, they will now have to transition. I don't know AppLavin's plan, if they're going to build a new programmatic marketplace or not. This is for them uh, to decide. But for marketplace, for, for buyers on marketplace, it's a big change. So all in all, it's again, it's a trigger event for, for many uh, players to make a decision how they're going to start 2022 on both UA and, and monetization. It's going to be interesting. Got it. And Josh, any concluding thoughts on in terms of winners and losers? Any, any other? I mean, you, you'd already talked about the impact of Facebook. Ouch. But <laughs> any other thoughts on any other? Players? No, I, I think Sophia in terms of winners. Um, uh, short-term winners uh, was totally spot on with uh, many of the SDK networks and um, more contextual focused um, advertisers. Um, I, I think in the, I think Offer is also calling out though a short-term decision for many developers that have very long-term implications. Right. I think that there are Maybe this is too somber, but I think that the number of mediation platforms may be treading water, but the the way that they make money is changing, and there aren't very many open, transparent mediation platforms left at scale. Um, Fiverr is the only one I'm really aware of, and there are other platforms, namely uh, Iron Source and and uh, and Max one from AppLovin, that. Um, are less independently, your data will be used a little bit more, and you have to weigh the potential uh, impacts of that. Obviously, AppLovin will tell you that um, your data is safe with them. I think the proof's in the pudding. Iron Source will not bid on, um, on Max mediated games because they don't want App11 to see who they think is valuable. Mm -hmm. And they kind of denied that, and there's a lot of awkward kind of conversations, like, why is that? And oh, I don't know, maybe we're just not performing. Oh, no. <laughs> but then IDFA went away, and suddenly on the lat waterfall, where there's no IDFA, so App11 can't track, suddenly Iron Source is bidding. And they have a real share of voice, but not on Android and not on iOS with the IDFA. Um, and that kind of tells you how valuable 
they view your mediation data. And that's the decision that you have to make between um, uh, open and transparent um, marketplaces and marketplaces that may provide other value as well in some way, um, but will also um, uh, take value in other ways as well. And it's very, very challenging decision to make. Joe, in the last five minutes we have, do you want us to play a little game of uh, three predictions until the, ne the next time we, we get together? Sure, yeah. yeah any predictions, trends, and any like big surprises for any of you? And offer since you suggested, maybe we start with you this time. Fair. So <laughs> if last time we said that hypercasual will survive and midcore maybe will take a hit, I think now it's time for midcore to make a, 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 a rebound with direct uh, publishers billing. I'm very excited about it. I really hope that it will open up a, a real opportunity for publishers to go with direct billing on, on, the, on the Apple platform on, on, on iOS. Could be yeah. super, super interesting. It's not easy put, right. separating legal from product, but I think it's an amazing opportunity if played right. So I'm yeah. excited about it. Uh, on the UA front, um, creators and influencers are becoming more and more interesting uh, and there are more and more tools for that uh, that you know I've been following and, and it's really really interesting to me to see how how big will creators and influencers you know get into our media mix of, of you know launching a new title or just supporting you you know new themes on new content so that's interesting and you know lastly I just recently f finished reading the the no rules rules book of Netflix I, mm. I enjoyed it a lot some pieces I took, some I, I, it was harder for me, but all in all, I, I like the book. And I look at Netflix, I look at Disney, and I think our industry is getting to a maturity point where it's similar to Disney and Netflix, how you bring together content and platform and UA and monetization. And right, these are the trends that we see in the industry. And it's really, really interesting to see how IP comes together, a, how cross promotion becomes really important as a as a driver for launching of new titles. So I would I would tell us all let's look at those giants and we can see basically where we are heading as an industry. So I think in, maybe in the next time we'll meet, we'll see even more even more examples. You know, getting closer to that size. Sophia. So on surprises, uh, well, I kind of was ready for everything to be honest. Like industry was, was going completely uh, south. So I guess the surprise uh, was evaluations of some companies or the exact numbers. Like they, some of them were very unexpected. Um, and then on the predictions, I think that the big enterprises currently being like forced into the choice, like what Offer mentioned, uh, will start, will actually become more and more uh, autonomous. And by that, I mean, from using somebody's tech and while, for example, they were using Mopub and stuff uh, and, and actually relying on the transparency and uh, they will start shifting towards creating the tech, or maybe buying or something who, who can do it. And so let's see if, if that works out. But I believe that we will see more and more enterprises uh, buying ad tech or creating their own ad tech and, and these type of rumors. Then the second one, well, there are some MMPs up for grabs, so let's see if next time we meet what what happens with some of them. Uh, and then, yeah, I see offer enjoying <laughs> this one. <laughs> okay, in the last one, um, I feel like that uh, we will see a very interesting range of experiences in games where games are trying to adopt like certain I don't know, hardcore games or midcore games. They will try to adopt. Um, some casual touch or uh, hidden object touch or basically combining experience within within uh, one game which which was not maybe expected at all uh, I think one of the uh, one of another examples was I believe March dragons who uh, started doing a little bit more of a, like a puzzle dynamic and such and I think uh, oh no the decoration actually the decoration dynamic I feel like this is super cool like I love this and who knows maybe it even happens with us. Okay. Josh? Cool. Um, I think I only really have one prediction, and it's just the expansion of the data wars. Um, <laughs> I think we're going to learn how valuable SK Ad Network data actually is, 
and it's going to become a new area to be fighting over. Um, but at a high level, I guess a kind of a, tang a kind of a, a parallel prediction would be that we go from the SK Ad Network apocalypse to the SK Ad Network new frontier. And we we start to see it as an expansionary thing with opportunity rather than a contractionary uh, force. Great. Yeah, I think it's awesome to end on a positive note, Josh. I hope you're right. And I just want to thank the three of you for jumping on, having this kind of conversation. This is exactly why I love to have these kinds of uh, discussions, to have really meaningful, deep, and you know, just controversial discussions about our industry. So I definitely want to thank you for that. And again, thank you for going over. And until next time, everybody, catch you all later. Th thanks, guys. Thanks, y'all. All right. Thank Bye. You. Thank you.